You're listening to Castrol CarCast on Podcast One. Hey guys, before we get started, let me tell you a little bit about Geico. Do you own or rent a home? Well, either way, I'm sure it could be hard work. But you know what's easy? Bundling policies with Geico. Geico makes it easy to bundle your homeowner's or renter's insurance along with your auto policy. And that's a good thing, too, because you already have so much to do around your home already. Go to geico.com, get a quote, and see how much you could save. It's Geico easy. Go to geico.com today. That's geico.com. Hello, welcome to CarCast. I am Matt, the moderator, DeAndrea. CarCast, of course, brought to you by our friends at Dodge. Dodge is offering power dollars. And with Dodge Power Dollars, for every horsepower of your new vehicle purchase, you'll get $10 off. So you want to peel out in a 2019 Dodge Charger RT Scat Pack? Well, you just got $4,580 off. Love our friends at Dodge. All right, so what's going on? Bill Goldberg is in Saudi Arabia wrestling, so uh, uh, he won't be here today. And uh, I just got over a cold last week, so if I sound a little um, off, that's why. I'll try not to make gross noises into the microphone, but uh, I apologize. Are you sure Bound it's, to happen? Are you sure it's a cold, not the coronavirus? Yeah, it probably is. And uh, our good friend Alistair Weaver from Edmunds.com is here. How you doing? I'm good. You get to do most of the talking because... Uh, Oh, we went to uh, we went to Joe Coy show. Joe Coy sold out the forum two nights. Huge, eighteen thousand people. It was a fantastic show. But the guy behind me was just sneezing and coughing and disgusting stuff the whole show. I went home next day. I was in bed. Like I was, I was just down for the count. I definitely got some weird, gross thing. And uh, just uh, loading up on uh, meds and vitamins and Zycam and all that stuff. Well, I flew back into LAX from London and, and got taken to um, like an extra screening room where Air China had just come oh, in. So yeah. there's all these people from China being quizzed about where they'd been in China, when were the last in China and everything else. And I was sat there in the middle of this. You're like, why am I in this why room? I, I don't want to be in this here. room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds terrible. Um, all right. So we got some cool things to talk about. By the way, did you guys see that Hot Wheels released – uh, one tenth scale remote control Tesla Cybertruck, and it comes with a sticker, an optional sticker that which which is it goes on the side glass of your remote control control Tesla Cybertruck, and it's the broken window from. Oh, the, that's cool! I like <laughs> that. So, if you want your Cybertruck with the smashed window from the from the from the press launch, it uh, it, it comes with that as well. <laughs> Fram's the chief designer. I mean, in terms of his profile in the world, that is yeah. Just- that is the best thing ever, and they they have the they have the small um, remote control version as well that goes on the track, the one sixty fourth scale as well. But the one tenth version will be limited edition. And there's the toy. There's we got a picture up there. There's the toy, and it comes with that. It's a sticker, so you could you could oh, you I can, want one of those. You so could include the smashed window in there. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, uh, Hot Wheels. Love that. I was um, there at that event, and that is definitely going to be one of those events where you say, I was there. It's yes. Quite magnificent. Oh, it's going to be fantastic. Uh, just a little reminder, uh, March 21st is CarCast Live at the Peterson Museum, uh, brought to you by our friends at Haggerty and Jegs.com. Uh, we're going to be doing a, a, a great event. It was so much fun last year. We hope you guys come out this year. Bring your car, anything you have. I just want to see everybody's car. Uh, there's going to be a car show that starts at 2 o'clock. <clears throat> Excuse me. A car show at 2 o'clock. There will be a screening of Shelby America in the documentary. And you may have already seen it, but we're going to bring some unseen footage and some DVD extras and stuff. So you can see that as well. I think that's around 4 o'clock. And then later in the evening... DVD, a, does that still exist? Well, it's Blu-ray, DVD. I just think I just said DVD extras because I feel like that's the term. It's retro. Yeah. <laughs> that's the term you probably recognize. But uh, there's the, the extra footage... And then there will be a live podcast. Adam and I will be doing a show there. Um, you can go to Why not, not invited onto that one. Yeah, no, go. Bring your, uh, bring your Porsche, bring your kids, bring your the kid. Bring the kid. one kid. Maybe there's the a second. Kid. Who knows? Have Who you knows? been home? Who knows? <laughs> Have you been home recently? <laughs> um, 
Uh, tickets at adamcrolla.com or just go to peterson.org slash carcast. Get some tickets. <coughs> Excuse me. It's going to be one of those days. It's going to be a solo show. Yeah, it's going to be one of those days. Um, what's new with you? Uh, all sorts of things. Uh, I was supposed to be going to Geneva next week. Um, I had to put actually – Pull out a couple of weeks ago for, for or a little while ago for for, for different reasons. But uh, as I sit here, everybody's wondering when it's going to happen because this Corona. I mean, for those who who don't know, Geneva historically was always one of the the biggest auto shows of the year. It was kind of the premier one in Europe, uh, attended by all the kind of glitterati globally as the, and you know in neutral Switzerland. Yeah, and it's supposed to happen the press days next Tuesday, and we're all waiting for a message as to whether this thing's happening or not. I mean, it's a it's a huge deal. I mean, just think yeah. about the millions, literally the tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions that are spent on this. And yeah. is it is it kind of late in the game to cancel it? Yeah. I mean, I, it, I was talking. So it's going to have to happen. It's just going to be kind of a flop. I, I don't know. I mean, we had uh, we had Alfa Romeo visit our office happens uh, from time to time. Manufacturers come in and show us the latest cars and we, we have a chat. And we, we, we talk about life and what we're all doing. And they're... Um, a global head of PR was saying, you know, we've been told not to travel, so it's it's a big deal. Yeah, I wonder how they do that. Do they try to find local representation? Do they have a team there? Do they have like a local PR team, a little bit smaller team? Yeah, but I guess I don't know. I mean, it's going to be an interesting show. Is how much money and how much is committed, but also if if people aren't traveling, and I think the other concern is people are worried that you're going to get quarantined. So you end up in Geneva. I'm going to keep talking. <laughs> you end up in Geneva. Yep. And if you imagine all the, the world, the company execs from all over the world tra- traveling into Geneva and then just ending up in Maroon there. I read that, it's um, that later this year we have the 2020 Olympics in Tokyo. And yeah. they're, they're saying, hey, we, we need a contingency plan. We may cancel the Olympics. And they said, but they need – you know they need minimum three months. They can probably do two months a, a lead way to to cancel it, but they can't do f- four days like like what you're talking about. They can't do five days. Well, also as, as you know, I'm a big Formula One fan. I used to work in Formula One in days gone by, and and you know there, there's a lot of conversations there about which Grand Prix would happen, which wouldn't, and yeah, it's uh, it's interesting times. We're also seeing it in terms of. Vehicle production as well, because a lot of parts, it's not just cars made in China, but it's also parts, supply parts moving around the world. So there's 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 a big impact going on. And what's going to be the effect of canceling Geneva? Is it really going to matter or not matter? Everyone's going to still release their cars and they're going to send out the press kits and 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 try to find some other place to like they're still going to announce the cars Every, yeah you're just doing digital you just do it digitally i mean i i was invited to a bunch of events down there um yeah i was going to sit down with the mercedes uh ceo the global ceo and the boss of amg and we we're going to you know have half an hour with with those guys and and that's always great for me because you always learn so much and they're fascinating fascinating individuals as well to be running something that big you know things like that obviously won't happen but you know, I, I know a couple of things that Mercedes is showing off, and yeah, they'll do a digital release. You'll, you'll, they'll send the images out. They'll send press releases out, yeah, and yeah. and away you go. I think the tough thing for Geneva and auto shows generally in New York's beginning of April um, is these things. You know, there's a lot of pressure on these shows. A lot of people pulling out anyway. Mm-hmm. If it doesn't happen, then will it ever happen again? And God knows what happens to the you know the the hundred. I bet it's into the billions almost. What's actually spent in 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 some on yeah. these things. Well, and all of these companies, so many companies are taking a financial hit already. Yeah. Everybody has to prepare for, you know, factories being shut down, obviously in the automotive space, but, you know, products all around the world that so much is is, is manufactured in China and now that that coronavirus is, is spreading. I mean, everything uh, in automotive is expensive and global. Yeah. So anything that's hits a glo- on, on a global level like this is going to be a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I saw you roll up in the uh, Acura NSX. I want to say new NSX, but it, it got sort of a revision this past year. A uh, little bit different arrow, and I think they did some adjustments on the suspension and stuff. Have you driven the NSX yet? So this is – I drove the original NSX, the you know the sort of iconic 89, I think it was, car, uh, many years ago. But the latest one had always passed me by. I'd always been doing doing something else whenever one was around. So I finally got into it uh, the last couple of days. It's a it's a fascinating thing. I kind of 
I really want to like it. I really want to love it because I like the idea of buying an Acura supercar. I think it feels yeah. It's almost like I'm comfortable in my own skin. I don't need some. I don't need a Ferrari or whatever. I'm going to buy an Acura NSX because I know what I like and I don't need to show off yeah, and yeah. everything else. So I really like. That. I like some of the technology, but I kind of feel it's almost too clever by half. In that you know. It's got the three and a half liter V6, the turbo, but then on top of that, these three electric motors, and there's a lot of really clever tech going on. But what that actually delivers is is questionable. And increasingly, I'm I'm less and less of a fan of plug-in. Oh, well, this isn't a plug-in, or, or of hybrids generally. I think these days you you either go all in on the electric, like the Taycan, or you know stick with a stick with a you know a, a gas engine like the new Corvette or something. And it's all to me, it feels like that choice now. And Carrying around all this complexity and all this weight and everything else for a hybrid just just almost feels like that's old tech, even though it's cutting edge on one level. I I, I see what you're saying. Um, yeah, it's funny how a, a hybrid technology almost seems a little old at this point, but <clears throat> I like that car a lot. I'm a fan of the NSX. I think it's a great like everyday sports car. I like I like that the electric drivetrain components contribute significantly to the performance of the car. It's not just there for fuel efficiency and, you know, like throwing a bunch of batteries into a Yukon to make it twice as heavy so it can go from 19 miles per gallon to 23 miles per gallon. Like this isn't really that. Um one of the things that annoys me on so many new cars is that start stop feature that's uh that every stoplight we do it and I'm I'm driving the Jag XF right now I'm driving to Adam's uh, Jag XF uh, as he switched into uh, the Infinity and we just pulled the fuse on that thing and I never have to worry <laughs> about it so it doesn't have that start stop feature all the you, time. You heard about climate change and things. <laughs> yeah. Um <laughs> you're like a Neanderthal man. Yeah. So uh, some gas. Uh, listen, problem solved. Um, <laughs> by the way, the catalytic converters and stuff is all so clean right now. Like let, let's if you want to talk about that let's talk about leaf blowers That's and some so other funny. things, right? Um, uh, it, you know, it's funny because uh, do you not like the peace and quiet at traffic lights and stuff? Stop lights. It's so annoying, and and you you inch forward and it fires up again. But on the NSX, when you get to a stoplight, it shuts down the gas engine, and it's in electric mode. And then you can creep forward, even when the light turns green. You can start to move forward very seamlessly. Yeah, you don't even notice, and it's all on electric power. And then it kicks in the gas engine, and it's as smooth and as nice as can be. I love that. The tech is great, and it's and also the ride quality is really good. Yep. And you're right; it's a nice everyday thing. There's a few oddities, like and this is a problem with a lot of these sort of low volume cars that the the sat nav system, the whole infotainment mm-hmm. system, is kind of not out of Acura 1980s spec. <laughs> it's 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 bizarre, um, and that you know those touch feet just because they can't afford to develop you know bespoke systems for that car and. There's a few little idiosyncrasies like that, but yeah, it's it, it feels to me like right now that it's a, almost a, an answer to a question that nobody's nobody's asked. And the car starts off at what 160, and then in the trim that we've got, the one that's out outside in the car park is is close on 200 yeah. because of all the carbon bits. Right. I'm beginning. I don't know what you think. There's about some that. pretty big incentives on it, though. I think you can get. I don't know. Ten thousand off sticker. You can get a. You can get. Yeah, there's some chunky, chunky discounts yeah. going on. I don't know what your view on this, but I've been thinking about this over carbon because we've been through this with our GT500 that Edmunds has just has just bought. We're also looking at it with the Corvette and everything else. The cost of carbon bits. Yeah, uh, it's little, all profit. Th- is there a massive cartel in carbon fiber? Because you know, on the on the track pack on the on the GT500, it's like another twenty grand or something. Yeah. And the, I'm far from convinced that carbon these days is yeah. so expensive. And right. if so, why? I know you've got to bait. I know the, I know the GT500 track for... pack, that carbon pack or whatever, the big cost in that is the wheels. Yeah. Um, but but you're right. Like, why is carbon? Look. I mean, on we... the NSX, it's 40 grams of the carbon, basically. And yeah. You don't need that. It's all – it's pretty much all aesthetic. No. When you, when you go and configure an NSX – like you said, it starts like 165. There's a few options that you want on it. 185-ish gets you a really nice NXX. And then you go and uh, you take, what, roughly 9 or 10 grand off the sticker and you negotiate yeah. it back down to about 165, 170. And you're like, okay, well, 
do I want an NSX for 170 grand? And such a lot of money. It's it? everything's a lot of money these days, it right? Is. Like everything seems like a lot of money. I, I mean, my problem is, what does it do that a Corvette at 70 grand doesn't do? Almost nothing. It did the technology. Obviously, the Corvette doesn't have the hybrids and da 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 da. Yeah. But that's the thing. And I, let's assume you can. Everything could be bought for sticker because I I got my mom a Toyota Rav Four, right? And uh, worked through a friend, went to a dealer, did the whole thing. And the guy's like, you got the RAV4 limited hybrid with the sunroof and all this stuff. He goes, these are rare. Nobody orders it with all the stuff. You yeah. Know? And uh, and uh, I said, yeah. You know, was, you know, the price is – the sticker is $40,000 and – and you know, here's here's your price, and uh, and he goes, you're you're getting a good deal. And I said, yeah, no, I appreciate that. I was like, no, 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 we we sell these for forty four. I go, no, you don't. He goes, no, 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 we we do. We he's like, we're we're getting forty four because the Rav four hybrids. I was like, you're telling me you asked for a fucking dealer markup on a Toyota Rav four? Why? Just because it's a Toyota RAV4 limited hybrid doesn't mean it's actually limited. And I was like, don't even start on this conversation. <laughs> I was like, just let me sign the papers and get out of here because I was like, I'm not going to get into this dealer markup conversation with you. I was like, you you don't get 44000 I was like, you don't get 44000 for it. Don't try to tell me you're getting a, a good deal on it because you want 44000 for it. You can ask all day 44000 for it, but you're not getting it. There's no way anyone's going to pay a markup on a Rav Four that they'll make a million of if they, if they're if they could. Yeah, it got me irritated. Damn it! It really it really winds you up this stuff, doesn't it? I'm tell you, it's this, market this, forces. Steal it, markup. Because you <laughs> mentioned Corvette for seventy thousand, and I go, yeah. yeah. And and I don't think there's going to be a shortage of Corvettes, but every the, dealer is there will want be for the next year. You know, that's yeah. the, that's what you're going to pay the premium for. It's, it's having it now. Yeah. Uh, if you're going to wait, a, you know, if you're willing to wait, it's like the Supra. The Supra now, you know, they've just updated that, um, giving it a tweak. But I think even Toyota was accepting this thing will burn bright for a couple of years, and then, you know, it'll be the next thing. I just drove the Supra. We we talked about it, uh, in, uh, I don't know, a few weeks ago. Um, had the yellow Supra. Yeah. Uh, you and I talked about it. There was a red one in the And then you the randomly present. passed me in the street because I was <laughs> yeah. like, who's that guy in a bright yeah. yellow Supra? I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I think I, I think I did pass by you the other day, too. I forgot where you were driving. I swear I saw you, and I was going. Oh, you passed by me, and I forgot what it was, and I was going to text you, but I was I was driving, and I was driving something that doesn't have texting ability, <laughs> which is funny because my truck does, but the Jag doesn't. The Jag XF doesn't have CarPlay in it, but um, uh, driving the yellow Supra, I liked it. Felt like it needed a little more power, and then like three days after I drove yep. it, Toyota's like, "Hey, we're going to release this thing with." Almost 50 extra horsepower next year. So everyone that was in such a rush over the last, what, two years yeah. to get a Supra for 335 horse, they're going to get, what, 385 now? Yeah, and this is the – you see this a lot. And, you know, even Bugatti plays this game. Yeah. You know, you just bought a Chiron or – I mean, the Veyron was terrible for this because they kept bringing out the Veyron. Then they keep adding and adding and adding. Yeah. And, you know, you just spent million dollars on a million and a half dollars or whatever it is on a on a Bugatti and then they literally uh, – yeah, there's another one with another 20 horsepower. and Yeah, and $100,000. Yeah. Every 20 horsepower yes. costs another 100000 or something. It's such a – it's such a – McLaren, a lot of the supercar manufacturers are really bad at this now. That, that I don't know. If I, was, if I was a consumer, yeah, it would really wind me up because you kind of bought the ultimate and then it's it's – and I understand that you bring a new model out and that's new, that's fine. But if you're just playing with the boost or just giving you an extra little bit yeah. and it's all bragging rights, isn't it? And it, at that level of the market, that's what that's what it is, isn't it? It's, it's turning up and going, ah, you know, it's well, like turning up in a – oh, you, so you have the Carrera. You don't have the Carrera S. Yeah. It's like yeah. I'm turning up at track days in a, in a Carrera. Oh, so you haven't got the S. You don't have the S. Yeah. Oh, Get to the back of the line. Yeah. Uh, you got to think about collectability as well. You know, yeah. Ford – Said what were the GT as GT. well. GT is the same. No, now we have a carbon pack, and now we have this pack, and okay, now we have that pack. The carbon pack they didn't pull from the existing. Then they say two fifty a year for four years, a thousand cars, and now the carbon pack they're going to do. I don't know how many they're going to do. Twenty or something. Twenty two. Yeah. 
That's not coming from the thousand, though, right? So now there's going to be a thousand twenty, uh, yeah, or and, and, and thousand twenty-five, or whatever ca- it is. I mean, there was a test case in Europe many years ago. Renault, when they sponsored, when they were in partnership with the Williams Formula One team, when they were winning with uh, Nigel Mansell and going back to the nineties, and Damon Hill and Jacques Villeneuve and co. And they developed this Clio Williams, which was this fabulous little hot hatch, and it was Williams branded, and and it was a limited run, and everybody bought them and everything else. And then suddenly they did a they they did another run of it. And they yeah. tweaked it ever so slightly. And the original owners sued. They did like a class action thing. Yeah. And lost. Because their argument was basically we've made an investment. You've told us this is a limited edition run. And now you've given it a bit of a tweak and you're doing another one. And they lost. So there are sort of all precedents. Right. Well, I guess stuff. there you go. Yeah. I guess so. I guess all the car manufacturers are like, we're going to do what we want. Because yeah. now there's a, there's a precedence to it. Um Speaking of, tell me about what's going on with Porsche. We've seen new 911s pop up, yeah. which I like. And Porsche always does the thing where like, hey, we got 911s, we got S's, maybe a uh, – of course, we're going to see a turbo at some point, a GT2, maybe GT3, uh, Targa, which I do like. Um, you mentioned to me that Porsche Turbo, 911 Turbo, is on the way. What can we expect from a 911 Turbo? What, what's the current setup for a, for a 911S? It's four-something four horsepower? Yeah, I mean, this is where – and also, that bear in mind that that's – yeah, that's four uh, – Is it 450? 450-ish, yeah. yeah. I should know this, but 450-ish, yeah. 450. So what they, what they are um, – what they're doing that can, of course, every 911 is now turbocharged, apart from the GT3s and stuff, which right. is, which is a kind of almost like a separate model. So yeah, this is the turbo with a capital T, and you get the air intakes <laughs> around the hornshires and everything else. And yeah, so this one is going to be. Hang on, I need to look at my like look at my notes, Matt. Bear with me a moment. Yeah, this is this is about to be. Well, in theory, the production version has been unveiled at Geneva on Tuesday, but who who knows? <laughs> okay. So this we believe is going to have six hundred and forty one horsepower. And Porsche. What's all, the current turbo? It's like five. Yeah, they, the nine nine six was four fifty, and then nine nine seven. Yeah, five eighty. And then you get the turbo S, which, which obviously is, comes on top of that. Yeah, and this is yeah. I'm trying to remember what the last one was. I think it was just over 600. 620? Um, yeah, because the S, you have the turbo, then you have the turbo S. Yeah. And and every time, and, and Porsche's always historically tried to stay away from just chasing crazy horsepower figures. But they've also recognized that in that market, you know, it does matter. And 3.8 liter twin turbo, 6, 641, 641 horsepower. horsepower. Now, you said, of course, it's supposed to be released at, at Geneva, and uh, maybe you're going to get an opportunity to drive it usually uh, before. I am in two weeks' time. Oh, right. There you go. And is it two weeks' time? Uh, middle of March, actually, up in Monterey. So there is the oh, okay. international launch. We're going along, taking a film, taking a film crew, so there'll be, a, there'll, be, um, there'll be a film coming up on Edmunds, and yeah, excited about it. It's, it's an interesting car, because everybody talks about GT3s, and, and I understand that, because everybody, oh, you know. I'm a racing driver. I have a GT3, but actually, the turbo is generally a much nicer everyday tool. So you have some expectations based on what we know about previous generations of turbos. You're expecting, you're expecting no manual transmission. You're expecting all-wheel drive. You're expecting correct the most comfortable drive for for a non GT car, right? So yeah. GT2, GT3. Those are going to be a little bit harsher, right? But so you're expecting like this is the most potent of the 911 street cars, and you know unless they do a Turbo S as well. This, this is the Turbo S that I'm this driving is the, actually. The Turbo yeah. S. So, so this is so 641 yeah. horsepower probably for the Turbo S. Maybe it's going to be I don't know 620 yeah. or something for for the regular Turbo. Um, I <clears throat> I don't know if they're doing this, but the previous Turbo S's I like that had the center lock wheels instead of the five lock. Yeah, and I just kind of like the look of it. And, and when you add those, when when you build a turbo, by the way, and then you build a turbo S, and you start to add all the turbo S stuff, you're like, oh, I want the competition pack, a little bump in horsepower, or whatever the the Sport Plus, and then uh, and you want the center lock wheels, and you want you know, like you're getting that turbo S money anyway. So the turbo S is going to be a two hundred thousand dollar car. Yeah, and we're talking about NSXs. I mean, this is yeah the the turbo, the nine eleven turbo. I mean, going way back to the seventies, but but certainly more recently has has been that. You know that person that wants to tick every box, wants something that's super quick, but wants something that's that's every day. 
uh, and it does an amazing job. I know a lot of kind of professional racing drivers, the successful ones, they have them because it's uh, it's just a great everyday tool, but is but is also insanely quick. Whereas a GT3, you can live with every day, but there's a bunch of compromises, yeah. rear seats, all sorts of things. Whereas you know this, um, but then the residual values if you're buying one. You know, used turbos are not that. If you look at what what say a nine nine seven turbo is, or even nine nine one turbos, they do tend to depreciate a lot faster than a GT three. So, as an investment, they don't make an awful lot. Of and the other thing is, everything's getting so fast. I mean, if a standard nine eleven is doing zero to sixty in under four seconds, you know, are they claiming that the turbo is going to be zero to sixty in around two and a half seconds? I was going to say it's got to be under three. And it's, it's also be- got to be, it's under three, and it's got to be as far. I mean, the interesting thing, and we're probably going to look to do this test at some point, is Taycan Turbo, Air, Ty- Taycan Turbo S against 911 Turbo. It's basically the same money. Yeah, okay. So uh, that would be a really interesting, Ooh, and do a very, uh, Taycan's more practical. But, yeah, it's kind of. It's more practical, but then, but it's not, it doesn't have the collectability, if that's what you're going after. But you're saying, hey, if you just want to, own a car for a few years or do yeah you, if you're gonna lease, lease, lease one or it, something you know if you want to lease your you don't think your, the tie cans collect it i just I mean, and then what and then yeah then the tech you know? the technology is moving on too fast but i don't think a 992 like my, my mom's got an iphone 6 and the battery doesn't work like she has to plug <laughs> it in all the time right it doesn't hold the charge so i don't know well what in 20 years from now what's the tie can gonna do <laughs> it's a good. It's a. It's a fair are you point. Get, and that's are what, you going to go on eBay get the knockoff battery for one third of the cost and probably, put it back in, probably. and and it's going to last you know six. You're going to have an independent and, specialist at the road. Who, yeah, you know, yeah. Last worked on an air cooled. He's now doing this, and yeah, I mean, interesting. We Edmund's advice is always when we look at electric EVs is is to lease them because the technology is moving on so fast, and you know a, a lot of luxury buyers lease cars anyway, but but for EVs particularly. Mm-hmm. It probably makes sense get it on a three year lease because in three years' time the market's going to look very different. Okay, well, speaking of, uh, you guys got a, a, a Tesla uh, on the way, and uh, did you buy it or lease it? We. <laughs> so it's an interesting story. We have um, for people who listen regularly, we've we've got a bit of a history of buying Teslas. Uh, we had a Model S, a Model y, a Model X. A Model Three, two Model Threes now, and, and then when I went to the unveil event of the Model Y, we put down our. our I even p- forgot there was a Model Y. Yeah, I mean the Model right. Y was like the first time that Tesla, maybe part of the Model Three, but the, the first time that he'd done something that you thought this makes complete business sense because the market is dominated by SUVs, and all the Model Y really is is a Model 3 where you've kind of put a magnet on the roof and, and, and dragged and it up. It. And Chris, stretch it. Chris, do we have a Tesla Model Y photo? Let's see what so, that looks like. Because uh, uh, Cybertruck uh, was getting all the press, and this is good the, or bad. But. Exactly. And this, I think when Cybertruck, when I went to Cybertruck event, you expected more of the same. Okay, a truck makes perfect sense in the US, so let's just do a sensible electric truck, done. And then they came out with Cybertruck, whereas Model Y was actually – is very sensible. You take the Model 3 platform, which is only like a skateboard anyway, mm-hmm. and just stick a different body on it. So it's kind of – it's a bit like – I think you ever saw something called the Golf Plus where they, they tried to take a yeah. Golf and basically just elevate it. And that's kind of what they've done here. So imagine a Model 3 where you've just put a magnet on the roof and, yeah. and kind of craned it up a bit. Now, what what size is it, let's say, compared to so Mustang Mach-E? It's basically the same size. It'd be a direct competitor to Mackie. Okay, so, so Mackie isn't bigger. It's not. No, uh, I'd have to. No, it's basically the same size. So the the Model Y is basically a Model Three platform, but if you stretch the roof up, you can change the packaging so that, yeah. for example, the seats you see a bit more upright, and that liberates a bit more room, as it does in an SUV. Yeah. So this thing is not a SUV in a true sense when you think about you know Rav Force me, but it's. It's a Model 3 where you sit a bit more upright. It's a little bit higher. Um, it, it liberates a bit more interior space. You've got a different rear rear deck, so instead you've got more of a hatchback instead of a instead of a, a sedan trunk as you have in the Model 3. So it's just a very sensible car. I think this will become Tesla's biggest seller because it'll just appeal to families. Why? I would have bought one of these instead of yeah. a Model 3 if it'd been yeah. available. So Chris put out the Mach E and the Model 3, and the Mach E is better looking. The, the Mackie, they've done a good, they've done a really nice a job looking, with it. 
They've it, done a really and, it's and sharp. Actually, I've just well, my wife has just leased it. We're just in the process of leasing a Model Three. Yeah, the, the, it's too early for us for the Y. Um, but I think we would have looked really seriously at the at the at the Mackie if we if it had been available. Um, but it's just our lease was up and we needed to move. But we need an electric car for what well, we want an electric car for carpools and stuff. It's a Southern California thing. Yeah. But yeah, I, I've been and as you know, I went to Detroit. Had a good what, what around the videos up on. If you go to YouTube, you'll see the um, the Mackie film that I did. Yeah, you did a big um, walk around and stuff on it. What's your yeah. take on it? What's your take? You've had a little bit more of an inside track on that car uh, than 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 most people. And almost anybody, Matt. Exclusive Edmunds first look. <laughs> there you go. Well, you definitely got it. It was a great video. I was super into it. Uh, what that. do you think of of Ford's technology? They're 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 the rookie in this. They're yeah. they're just starting off. What do you think of Ford's technology and what they're doing with the Mach E? And will it compete with something like Model Y and Tesla's technology? You see, interestingly, Ford has taken a, a when the new C, CEO came in a couple of two or three years back. Ford's policy at that point on EVs was simply we were going to do a Focus and stick a stick a motor in it. It was like a token gesture. It was ticking a box. Yeah, um, and and then when the new, when the new CEO Hackett came in and, and Jim Farley, who's who's now effectively a COO, came back from Europe, they just said this is this is nonsense. We've got to get in this game and get in this game properly. So they set up a team called Team Edison, which is within Ford, you have Ford, and then you have Ford Performance, who mm-hmm. do things like GT500, and they are allowed to operate by different rules. They recognize that if you're building lower volume and you've got to, you've got to move quickly, you've got to be agile, you know, you've got to break a few rules. So it's a bit like the Navy SEALs. Yeah. It's a bit of a silly example, but you know what I mean? It's like, you guys have got a special job to do, so we're going to, you know, we're going to take a liberty with the beard and the silly hairstyle. It's, it's that, basically. Yeah. So, and they've adopted the same approach with um, with Ford's electric division under something called Team Team Edison. See what they did? See what they did there? Yeah, no, I got it. I got um, you. <laughs> and and so the it's actually been developed almost like a Skunk Works project, like the GT was as as well. So, you know, they have a huge amount to learn, but they've got a lot of very clever people there. Um, and also, you think about the car; a lot of it's supplier based anyway. So it's about can you go to the right suppliers? Can you start to put those pieces of the jigsaw together and then package it up appropriately? And you know the the Mackie is one of those cars that I am most excited about driving this year. We can argue about Mustang name or whatever, but you know it's a it's a proper thing. I think it yeah. looks good. It makes a lot of sense on paper, and I'm super excited. And you know it's a it's a classic rival to the Model Y. It'll also be the first test as to whether a what you might call an old world manufacturer can really go up against it and capture the imagination. Yeah. And the support network after the fact, which is one of the issues that any startup company, you know, yeah. is is going to have, you know, Tesla, Rivian, you know, you know, we, we talk yeah, about I mean, Rivian. Ford has money in Rivian, you know, Ford yeah. has invested in Rivian. And, it's interesting. And they're going to be using that uh, for their Lincoln platforms. But one of the things we've talked about here several times is is i'm a i'm a fan of of rivian i like what they're doing it seems like that they're pretty good technology they've been raising good money but why not just be a technology company why make a truck and sell it to the public because now you have to have a dealer network or or own all of your own things like tesla does and then uh, service and warranty and it's like you're battling something that is so complex that it's probably one of the main things that Tesla has an issue with. Uh, it probably costs them more money to run that side of the business than it does to make cars because they're so focused on on the making of the cars. Everything Elon Musk is like, this is the car, this is it's great, and it's whatever. He never really talks about, you know, take it in for service if it's broken. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, why it, why create that network when a Ford or a GM or somebody has – you know, not just that network, but a hundred years into figuring it out. It's an interesting question because actually, <clears throat> the flip side of that is you don't have any of the legacy problems. You don't have all the the healthcare and pension costs. You don't have the dealer network. You're not giving away margin to dealers. Yeah. So it's a it's a double you know it's it's a double edged sword. All that stuff. But you're right. I mean, there was a lot of I mean Tesla's share price and everything else. I don't think we want to get into that too much here, but there's a lot of people betting that really their Tesla share price is based on the fact that they don't have all this legacy issues 
and you know self driving tech and everything else is 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 where the future lies. So, you know, I I just well we're getting them potentially getting a Model Y. Just bought a Model Three, and you know you you're dealing directly with Tesla. You do it through the website. You're not haggling on price. They don't have many options, or there's not much personalization, and people are willing to accept that for now at least. So you choose the color, you choose the wheels. That's pretty much it. So you know they have a they have a lot of advantages in the marketplace. Well, but it is incredibly capital intensive. Building a car and building a network requires such a lot of money. And Tesla are always, you know, they're never you know it's arguable how you define profit. And you know they they're burning. Billions of dollars. They're just doing another finance round. It is such a difficult game, and at the risk of name dropping, I had a, a sit down with guy called Herbert Deese, who's the global boss of the Volkswagen Group. Fascinating guy, super impressive, and he was talking about Tesla, and he said, you know, I, li- I like Elon and I like what they're doing, but it's so much cash, it's, and you know how how can they keep keep going with all that cash? And if you look at a company like Rimac in uh, in Europe, Rimac is yeah, Rimac is basically Europe's. Um, Europe's to, uh, Elon Musk, and I met the guy because if you remember on on the Grand Tour, Richard Hammond crashed, yeah, uh, crashed the Rimac, and that actually nobody would have ever heard of that car if he didn't crash it. No, but it was a massively <laughs> difficult moment because Rimac was really breaking through, and, and Mercedes invested in them. There's all sorts of in- investment in Rimac, um, and I got brought in to sit down with Richard Hammond from the Grand Tour. It's like the last job I did before I moved to yeah. the US to sit down with with Rimac to sit down with Richard Hammond and. What the guys at the Grand Tour are trying to say is that we don't want to kill this company, and we're fully aware that there'll be so much nonsense on social about it was this, it was that, and you know was Hammond going too fast? Was it the car that did something eccentric? And nobody wanted to accept any sort of fault. So I was brought in to kind of mediate this conversation where we all agreed that nobody would really admit any fault, but we'd just talk <laughs> about what happened with a view. And if you look at it, it's on I think it's on Drive Tribe, and it's got um, you know millions of views now. And it was all about explaining what happened and da 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 da. So. It was. Uh, What's their model? What's the Rimac model? You buy direct from them. So they've got. They are developing their own car, but then they're also the Pininfarina, for example, uses uh, uses Rimac technology and Rimac chassis, and so in the same way that Ford has invested in Rivian and what they, you know, I mean, it's possible that I think Rivian are going to come to market, but also you might take a view down the line that they're better off being a, you know, like a third party supplier and Ford's getting into to Rivian because, you know, maybe it'll help with the F one fifty E V and things like that. So the world is so changing Ford's so Ford's narrative has been the Rimac platform is gonna power whatever Lincoln's gonna come out with electric, but yeah. Ford's F one fifty is homegrown. And that way well be the case, but you'd be it'd be mad not to share certain technologies, you would right. imagine. At this point, yeah. Yeah. Because if you think about suppliers, because I guess there's sort of two schools of thought. If you're If you're, let's say, Ford and you're coming up with an electric F-150 or a Navigator or, in in the most recent case, a Mach-E, does Ford sit down and say, this is what it should be, you know, these are the specs we need? Do they put word out to all of their suppliers and say, hey, is anybody developing something like this, like certain batteries, certain motors, certain whatever, certain – Cables, plugs, cooling system, whatever. Is anybody doing that? <clears throat> it's, me. I, I or think, do they say, we have an idea. Can you make this? Can you make uh, this cooling system and these plugs? I, I think it's um, from what I've, I've, I've been involved with, and I, I shot a documentary about how they put the Focus RS together. It's a bit of both. Ford basically will sit down or any manufacturer will sit down and a lot of it will be market research. Say, right, this is where the market is. This is what a Model Y looks like. This is what we think is coming from XYZ. This is how much it needs to cost. This is, you know, the marketing considerations, yeah. who the demographic is. You know, there's a huge amount of work goes into defining what a vehicle is. And then at that point, they will say – they will basically draw it up. It's like designing a house, isn't it? You, and then you get the architect in. They say, I need all of these things. Then they say, well, who makes that bathroom and who makes that kitchen tap and da, 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 da. Right. So then you work with your suppliers. You know, Maybe it's some – if it's like Focus RS, there's Ricardo was involved, Brembo were involved, Ricaro as well. You know, There's all these yeah. different, different people involved. And we would go out with the development engineers and there'd be, there'd be four in-house people there. There'd also be Ricardo people there. There'd also be – you know, Bosch people there or whoever it, whoever it may be. So it's a massive partnership. And, of course, it's all, 
shared technology. You know, yeah. Ford aren't developing tyres. You know, they're going to Michelin or Pirelli, and then they'll work with whoever it may be. And normally, most manufacturers will do two. So if it's Porsche, you might do, you know, you might do Pirelli and Michelin. I'm making it up, but you might go with those guys, and then they will both develop a tyre, which means there's a bit more choice in the market. So. Uh, Ineos, I mean, it's probably a car you've never heard of. Ineos Brigadier is going to be this new sort of hardcore off-roader by one Britain's richest man. Uh, Ineos, big petrochemical uh, billionaire. And basically, he, I was talking to him and he just said, well, you know, we, we can go to 16 different suppliers and it's a jigsaw. We just put the pieces together. Just put them together. You design it, you market it, and away you go. You think, you think the suppliers that have a regular relationship with the car companies <clears throat> are constantly – pitching ideas or stuff that they're developing. They're saying, hey, you know, by the way, Ford or GM, uh, we've been kicking around this idea of doing whatever. Yeah. You know, uh, we're going to start working on that. You let us know. We just want to get it on your radar, see if it kind of comes up there. Well, a good example of that would be on on the TV adverts at the moment. GM's talking about this this trailer tow technology where it basically virtually removes the trailer. That was the third startup, and we actually gave it an award at CES. We gave it an Edmunds Tech Driven Award a couple of years back, and then GM picked it up, and now GM is marketing it as you know GM's great idea. Awesome. Yeah, I've got uh, I've got even in my truck my ninety five Lightning. I have the rear view mirror with a camera in it, and I can flick it from mirror to camera. Yeah, and Do you uh, like those things, I can't get on with them. Yeah, so I'll, I'll tell you the trick about it is. Um, but, you know, the company that developed that, I spoke to them. They sent it to me. I used it. And now it's starting to show up in in uh, in vehicles from an OE. So the idea is let's say you have an SUV and your rearview mirror, you've got, you know, you've got the kids, you've got the soccer team, you went to Home Depot, and you can't see out the, the back because it's full of kids and plants. Yeah. But if there's a camera on the rear glass, you get a clearer view. You switch it to camera mode. Now, the problem is is the depth perception. Yeah, I've driven a few of these things. I find them. Yeah, I find my eyes struggle to go from looking at the road yeah. to looking at a camera and back again. So the I spoke to the manufacturer, and he's like, "Yeah, we're we're trying to figure that out." <clears throat> Excuse me. They're trying to make that work better. They have a much more complex version for racing cars. So if you're, you know, vintage car, new car, there's a mirror that you could use with a camera. <clears throat> and uh, it has far more adjustability. So in my truck, because I'm running a standard cab pickup truck, the camera and the rear view mirror are not that far from each other. So I can run it camera mode all the time, and the depth isn't that bad. Right. Right. So now you just get used to it once, but it allows me to see a wide view that I can't see with just the mirror. So I can actually see the back of the truck a little bit and then behind the truck and a wider view. So for me, it actually works out pretty good. But my rear view mirror and my camera are two feet apart. Because I'm in a standard cab pickup, but yeah, it's just on so the back glass. So it's not a big right? deal. If I moved it six feet back, you know, at the tailgate or something, then it would be much different. It's funny. I was looking – I was reading something recently about, you know, we all talk about autonomy and, and that's that's backpedaling a little bit. Most manufacturers are backpedaling on it. But we might, before you and I kind of kick the bucket, we might actually looking back and saying the idea that we were driving along, talking on the phone, looking at mirrors – yeah, yeah. It just it, it seems so kind of. Old I don't school. know why we have side mirrors now. Why aren't we just using the technology? Everybody's developing well, it's, it's it. It's a legislative thing that's in the it. US. That's just, yeah. it's, a it's pure legislation. Um, all right, let me tell you guys a little bit more about Dodge. Visit your local Dodge dealer where they bring you performance, technology, and great deals. There's never been a better time because right now Dodge is offering Power Dollars. You've heard us talk about it for. With Power Dollars, you get $10 off for each horsepower of your new car. doesn't matter. 2019 Dodge Charger, 2019 Dodge Challenger, whatever you like. You can pick up a 2019 Dodge Charger RT Scat Pack with 485 horsepower, and you'll receive an almost $5,000 cash allowance. So if you get more power, you get more off. It's that simple. So hurry into your local Dodge dealer today and take advantage of Dodge Power Dollars. Um, okay, so I had another question. Now it's escaping me right now, but I think we're running out of time. Cadillac anyway. Escalade. Yes, Escalade. That's right. 
I'm looking at your notes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's it's Caddy, es- Caddy Escalade. We yeah. had a that that's what something that we had like if you had another film that we did recently. The interior looks good to me. The rest of it is yeah, it's the same. Yeah, it's got some it's imposing. I went uh, I like the dash, like a big The dash it's got like this big OLED uh display like you get yeah. on high end TVs. So I, I think GMs uh, you know recently and quite rightly on things like the Blaze have been criticized for interiors, but they've really made a step on this. And it's independent rear suspension, so it's a lot less truck like. It's super imposing. I think it looks pretty good, very kind of looks like an Escalade. It's very kind of, you know, American and, and, yeah, and Birch. Yeah. And, but the interior looks terrific. I actually went to um, – they always sponsor this pre-Oscars thing. And I went to um, – it sounds terribly hot, ter- terribly LA, doesn't it? They went to Chateau Marmont and they did this event at the Chateau Marmont. Yeah, and they'd, and they'd, yeah. they'd craned an Escalade into to sit by the swimming pool and I was talking to the with the project chief for the for the Escalade and you know like you meet a guy who's been developing this thing in Detroit for years and yeah. around the world and suddenly he's standing in the middle of the chateau my mom by a by a swimming pool at some sort of stupid Hollywood event and it yeah just, you know it we, was just so it was such a bizarre experience but he was a really nice guy really interesting and and he was telling me about the about the vehicle and oh yeah by the way that like influences as far as the eye can see that's incredibly expensive <clears throat> Years ago, we did the Paul Newman premiere. The uh, we I'm did going to be ill tomorrow morning. We did the the debut for the uh, Paul Newman documentary, and uh, we had to switch venues at the kind of the last minute. We were at the Roosevelt Hotel, and we needed to bring one of the Paul Newman race cars into the hotel, and it wouldn't fit through the front, through any of the side doors or the front, even if you remove the doors. But there was a there was a back parking lot where the catering company comes in, but there's ramps and trees and, and all that stuff. So we had to crane a Paul Newman race car over the entire Roosevelt Hotel, drop it down into a little courtyard, and push it through the conference room to get it into the lobby. And and Adam paid for this. Uh, it was it was a it was a. It was paid for by sponsors, but right. it was – and the whole Red Carpet premiere was also a fundraiser for the charity. Oh, okay. That's right. Great. So the whole thing was a nonprofit. So we you know, we, we covered the expenses and the rest went to charity. And uh, it cost – I think it was $10,000 to get the crane there. And that's because the crane was able to get into the back parking lot of the Roosevelt Hotel. If we had to close down Hollywood Boulevard – it would have been three times the cost, but and the crane has to sit there overnight because the next day he moves the car out. So it you you pay the guy like I think it was ten grand. It could have Jeez. been fifteen We're grand. In the wrong but, game. Yeah, it was uh, uh, the only exciting part for me was <clears throat> Paul's older brother Arthur Newman, who is ninety or ninety one when we did the film. He's probably ninety six now. Uh, he's in the film. He's fantastic. And great interviews with him, and uh, we we had him come out. We put him up in the hotel and the whole thing. The next morning, we were moving the car out, and he came out with his. He has his little cane, and his cane like turns into a little chair. So wherever he wants, he can just kick legs out, and he can sit on That's it. Fantastic! It's like a little stool, and uh, it's like, hey, Arthur, how you know? Good morning, how you doing? He's like, great, love the movie, thank you so much. And I said, hey, you want to see something cool? And he's like, yeah. I came over and uh, we, we were standing by the car and we were taking pictures and he's like, oh, I love the car. It's great seeing my brother's name on it. I go, okay, well, it's going to go now and it shoots up into the air and it's like a little dot. And he's like, wow. And then we went out to the front parking lot and they lowered it down. I was like, it's your brother's car flying through the air. It's, I don't know, 25 stories, 20 stories up in the air. It's just and like X little, million dollars. Yeah, it's just, it's ridiculous. It's a big giant metal plate and with, you know, four cables going to it, and they just put the car on it, strap it down, and they just. In a previous life, when I used to run a production company in London, we actually looked at helicoptering cars from across the UK, and yeah, yeah, but helicoptering is something that makes the car look good. Yeah, yeah you, you can rack up a bill pretty quickly. Yes, you can. But sometimes flying that stuff is cheaper than hauling it on the ground. Yeah, you'd be surprised. And like, it looks fl- very cool. Flying a car to the UK, like for us to do, like Goodwood or something. There was a famous incident with uh, Ford, and I think it was the was it might have been a GT500 or GT350 or one of them, where they the haulage company, the the um, transfer company, made a problem uh, where instead of put, they put it in the wrong ship, and it went to Central America instead of to the UK for Goodwood. Did you hear about that story? No, I don't know. Whether this, I was told this off the right. I'm probably giving away state secrets here, but I understood the story where the cars literally went on the wrong ship, 
and ended up going off down Panama or something when they should have been coming to, to Goodwood. <laughs> And Ford, as a result, then had to, or presumably the shipping company that made the error, had to fly vehicles. And I think getting, I remember getting a quote to fly a couple of vehicles for a project that I was working on years ago. And it was about three quarters of a million to start flying two or three vehicles. Because you end, if you're not careful, you end up having to basically hire your own plane. In that scenario, yes. But I think if we flew a car from here out of LAX to, to the UK for a Goodwood... I think it's like 10,000 each way. But by that's not like a business, that's not much more than the first class, first class fare boat, for a person. Boat is like 7,000. Yeah. And it takes six weeks or eight weeks. You can fly it for 10,000, you're there in four days, five days. Yeah. Right? It's much cooler. And yeah. So now it's. Like, I don't know, the boat thing doesn't really make that much sense, especially if you want to keep track of your car. And people are like, yeah, but a plane can go down. So can a boat. Didn't Porsche lose a bunch of cars uh, on a Jaguar, boat? Jaguar did. Jaguar yeah, Jaguar yeah. too? Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. The boat went down somewhere in somewhere in Europe and they took took it. Yeah. I don't want my car to get coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> Just strand, stranded quarantine It sounds like Europe. I have that now. I apologize, guys, for making terrible noises. Um, anyway, so what's, what's, what's the verdict on the... Uh, on the Cadillac Escalade. Well, we haven't driven it yet, and we'll always reserve judgment on anything till we've till we've driven it. But you know, a bit like the new Suburban, you know, GMs. I think GM, from what we've seen, uh, just on sitting in it and sort of poking around and prodding things, they they seem to have done a nice job. Uh, and GM needs a bit of a, a bit of a win at the moment. Um, yeah. You know, some of the recent stuff's not been that great. So, no, we're looking forward to driving that. And you know, if you think the Germans have got into that market with X7 and GLS, which are both great products as well, so. You know, obviously, Explorer is. Um, that's right. Expedition is also in that market. So there's, yeah, yeah and, Navigator, and they've sold, and they've sold yeah Navigator. I mean, they've sold nine hundred thousand um, Escalades since they started building them. It's crazy. It's just big volumes. It's a lot for something we that is bigger than most apartments. Yeah, yeah, we love big trucks out here. Um, <clears throat> all right. Well, we're running out of time. I wanted, I wanted to pick your brain about this rumor going around that the, uh, the, the. The hotter version of the Corvette, be it a Z06 or ZR1 or whatever, may not have a pushrod engine. It may have an overhead cam, maybe four-valve engine in it. Have you heard this before? I haven't. Um, uh, I haven't been super close to it. I know there's prototypes running around of Z06 or whatever it's going to be called. Yeah. I mean, it's possible they may want to do something significantly it, different. It would, to, I mean, to really differentiate between the Corvette and the and whatever the hotter version is. Of course, we know there's going to be hotter versions of these. Cars, yeah, there'll right? be a Z06, then there'll be a, a Z01 eventually, which is probably yeah, way off. But which, I mean, the other thing is, have they pushed the engine that's in the standard car as far as they can? Because also, I was thinking, you know, that car's got what four sixty horsepower, or something. Yeah. 40, you know, really, that's all you really need on a road car. So, at what point? Yeah, but you it's know, not it, about need. It's not we about need, that. but above that, you've got to really differentiate it. So, you know, obviously different engine options and everything else. But, yeah, maybe they're looking at engines saying, you know, naturally aspirated. This is kind of as far as we can go. Well, Ken Lingenfelder bought like four or five of these things already. So he's like, we can do a drag pack and a street pack and a blower pack and a naturally aspirated pack. He's developing everything you can yeah. possibly imagine because that's his business and he'll do it. I mean, ZR1 yeah. was obviously supercharged, but obviously this is this is mid this is mid-engine now, yeah. so you've got to think about all the cooling and I'm not. I mean, obviously, yeah. getting turbocharged and everything else. It's interesting. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. I like the car. I I, I can't wait to get in and and, uh, and drive one a little bit. But um, it's a good thing. Well, see, Edmund's top-rated sports car for 2020. It's and I fantastic. slide an extra plug-in before I, the end of the show. I'm telling you, I I love the drag race that you guys did. I think. Did you guys physically weigh the car, or you're going by their spec? Because the rumor is now is the car weighs less than what. Ford is even claiming the GT500. The GT500, we had ours down at the track because we've taken delivery. In fact, if you, uh, if you, we've done a great, Carlos Lago did a great unboxing video for us talking yeah, through yeah, it I all. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, it's, so yeah, we had it down that we, we, we weigh everything independently in all four corners. So, um, I'd have to have a look at Yeah, that. we'll have to dig up the We haven't got the that. track pack and frankly, I think it looks, the one we've got and Check it out on, on on YouTube. The one that we've got has got the gurney. It's got the performance pack on it, which gives you the gurney flap. So you get the you literally get the gurney flap in the trunk, 
Yeah. Um, you'll see this on the film. A bunch of bits, the front splitter, everything comes on the uh, – sorry, the uh, the wicking stuff. And, and then the gurney flap is in the, the trunk and you have to literally manually screw it in, presumably because it's not homologated or something. But it looks so much cooler than the carbon fact. There's nothing cooler oh, yeah. than a gurney flap. Yeah, I agree. I think it looks badass. I do like the idea that some assembly is required. It makes it kind of fun. It does. Yeah, I think it kind of makes it fun. All right, you guys want all this information and a lot more, go to edmunds.com slash road noise. And of course, you can follow Alistair Weaver. He's on Twitter at Alistair Weaver, and he's Weavometer on Instagram. Uh, definitely give him a follow. You guys are going to love all the great stuff that he's doing. Of course, you can follow me at Motorator and uh, and uh, our buddy Goldberg. He's out. He's wrestling, and uh, he's trying to trying to get in shape. They gave him three weeks to get in shape to go to Saudi Arabia and wrestle. He's a little nervous about it, but uh, he's a big boy. He can handle himself. Did you see the Instagram picture of the sushi that he was eating for yeah. lunch? That, I mean, that was like a week. That's like a week's diet for me. So last week, we actually talked a little bit about what the, the diet is of a wrestler. That's his post-workout uh, lunch, and then he goes home and eats dinner. <laughs> yeah, he's uh, he's he's a big boy. You can follow him. He's Goldberg95 <laughs> and Goldberg's Garage on Instagram. Uh, all kinds of cool uh, car stuff and wrestling stuff. It's it's fun. We love him. Um, and uh, again, uh, uh, March 21st, Peterson Automotive Museum, Car Cast Live event, big car show. Bring out your car. Get tickets. Uh, Peterson.org slash car cast. Or I think you can just go to adamcrollo.com. And uh, uh, show us your car. Stay for the screening. Stay for the podcast. It's going to be a, f- a good time. <clears throat> Maybe you'll come out. Bring uh, something with you. That came last yeah. year. It was a yeah. great day. Uh, I think I'm going to bring the Lightning and the M3. We're going to have a buddy drive the M3 down. And uh, <laughs> next week I'll give you an update on the Lightning because uh, I got the rebuilt supercharger back. And for you nerdy guys that know the Ford stuff, I rebuilt the PSOM. In the gauge cluster unit, it definitely shifts better, and it wasn't even shifting at four grand at wide open throttle. Now it goes to five grand, shifts hard, and I'm pulling more boost than I was before just on the rebuild and the shifting from four and a half pounds to, I don't know, I think 6.8 is what I saw, but I wasn't really on it uh, completely. So um, night and day difference just doing the rebuild on that thing. Uh, So we'll get into that more next week. Um, All right, guys. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for listening. Again, it's edmunds.com slash road noise. Thanks for coming in. Thank you, Matt. It's always a pleasure. Until next time, keep the air in the spare and the bag in the wheel. For the latest updates and call-in times, follow the show on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at CarCast Show. If you'd like to write in, fill out the form on CarCastShow.com. And don't forget to give us a nice rating on iTunes. CarCast is a Corolla digital production and is produced by Chris Loxamana. For more information, visit carcastshow.com. Hey, guys. Thanks for listening to our show. Hope you enjoyed it. Just a reminder, check out Geico. You know, you maybe you own or rent your, own or rent your home. Well, you should bundle your policies with GEICO. GEICO makes it easy to bundle your homeowner's or renter's insurance along with your auto policy. And that's a good thing, too, because you already have so much to do around your home. Just go to GEICO.com, get a quote, and see how much you could save. It's GEICO easy. Go to GEICO.com today. That's GEICO.com.